Um, so in this second lecture, uh, in principle, I have materials to cover uh, what I call that data characterization modeling and errors. I think I'm going to skip modeling, but I will say something about data characterization and, and of course, errors. Um, so uh, I'm going to cover some of these topics, not, not every, everything, but the, the slides will be available online so you can access them. Um, the first topic, static uh, stati uh, statistics and estimator, uh, leading to the notion of precision and accuracy. And we'll talk about some basic estimators that are concepts that are familiar to you, uh, no doubt, mean and RMS, um, but in the context of statistics. Talk a bit uh, about histograms also in that context. Um, I'm not going to talk, I think, given the time uh, based on uh, the first lecture, I probably will skip uh, the, these um, and I will talk about uh, other topics that I don't have on this slide. <coughs> okay, um, so this morning I've given you a very quick introduction of the notion of probability, the notion of probability density function how we can characterize these uh, PDFs, these probability density functions, um, from a theoretical standpoint. That is, you have a function, you can estimate, calculate the properties of this function and uh, characterize the, the PDFs based on the knowledge of the PDFs. Now I'm going to take a purely experimental or more experimental perspective and say, okay, um, we're going to do the measurements and and, and figure out what we do with these measurements. And so when you have a measurement, um, sometimes you, um, you have re no preconception of what you're going to measure. Uh, and so you're going to try to look at all ways possible to uh, plot the data. Somewhat, sometimes you have a, an objective, a very specific objective. So if you, let's say you're measuring the, um, the plant constant. Uh, you're going to carry out a measurement that determines this, this, this value. And sometimes you're trying to uh, understand relationship between different, par uh, different quantities. For instance, the cross-section as a function of the momentum or the transverse momentum of the particles that are produced in a certain reaction. So depending on the context, um, the analysis that you will do will be simple, sophisticated, or very sophisticated. But at the end of the day, it's all the same idea and it's all based on what we call a statistic and so when when we do statistics we're going to measure statistic uh, quantity that we call statistic based on sample data <clears throat> so um, so I, I want to say briefly notion of population sample estimators and statistics so let me define these quantities in a somewhat formal way so first, the notion of sample or population. In general, statisticians will refer to the population as the, uh, as the totality, the, all, the whole of possible outcomes of a measurement. And the sample will be uh, what an experiment actually has measured. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to assume that when there is a measurement, one can characterize the measured value, let's say x, by some PDF. Right? I'm going to call this PDF f of x, but I will assume no knowledge of this PDF. And so the PDF will take some values in the sample space, or that is all values of x, uh, sometimes called the parent population. And we're going to now uh, think of doing a measurement, perhaps a repeated measurement of x, to try to get an idea of what this function might be. In some t sometimes we'll be interested in knowing the, f the full function precisely. Sometimes the mean will be sufficient. Sometimes the RMS will be sufficient. So depending on what kind of experiment, what, kind of, what is your interest, um, there will be different types of analysis one can do, but at the end of the day, you, as you will see, the concept is always the same. And so um, this, I will say that I have a sample of size n, and this sample will constitute what I call the experiment. 
So my sample of size n might, might consist of many values, x1, x2, xn. And these might, in a, in a simple case, I will be measuring the same quantity several times, repeatedly, n times. Now, when you think of this as a, me as a measurement, you have to realize that each value of x is itself a random quantity. And so as such, this vector of n objects, n values, it spans a vector space of n dimension, or a space of n dimension. Um, if now these measurements, these repeated measurements of x1, x2, and so on, uh, these measurements could in principle be correlated. The, the outcome of one measurement could depend on the outcome of the previous measurement. But here I'm going to assume that all these measurements are carried out independently. So if you were to compute the covariance of x1, x2, x2, x3, and so on and so forth, all these covariances would be zero. And that's going to what we are going to assume here. And so the first thing that we're going to do then here is try to conceptualize what the PDF of x will look like when I think of the PDFs of each of those values, even though I don't have a priori a PDF for these things. And so I carried out a measurement of n values. Okay? This measurement has a certain probability or density of probability. I'm going to call that f of the sample. If all the measurements are independent, if the measurement of x1, x2, x3, and so on are independent, then the probability of these n values is simply the product of the probability of each of the values, or the densities of each of the values. Okay? So it's, if I have five dice, I roll them all at once, the probability of measuring face one, face one, face one, six times, is one six times one six times one six times. All right, so one six to the power six, and so the outcome of each of the measure of each of the value with a roll of dice would be one six one six one six. If I'm doing this now, if this is a particle physics measurement, I'm measuring the momentum or the speed of light or the mass of some particle that has never been observed before. Each of those measurements are independent in the statistical sense, or considered independent. Uh, uh, actually. So, so <clears throat> conceptually, conceptually this is easy. Now let's assume that I actually don't know these functions f. Let's assume that f of x is not known. Um, I would like to know something about the population, the, the PDF of the sample, but f of x is not known. So I, from the get-go, I appear to be in trouble. Now, let's say, okay, I, I'm not interested so much in the full representation or knowledge of, the popul of f of the sample, the PDF of the sample, but I'm interested in knowing some, something about it, the mean, the RMS, or some other characteristics. I'm going to call these other char this characteristic uh, theta. There might be just one, or there might be many of them. Okay. And so my interest then will be to find a technique, a method, to obtain these quantities based on the data that I have measured. This brings about what we call statistic and estimator. <clears throat> So I've made a measurement. I character, I, I, this measurement I describe in terms of a vector of n quantities, x1, x2, x, xn. And so if I'm now what I'm going to try to do is characterize this measurement uh, in terms of some quantity. Now these quantities, that could be the mean. Uh, but it could be if I have observed um, Let's say I'm observing an object falling uh, from some height uh, as a function of time. So I, can, I could characterize the, the height or the, the, the elevation as a function of time. 
And so I would be interested in, for instance, determining the acceleration, the gravitational acceleration. So the acceleration would be something that I might be interested in. So obviously for that, I'm going to have some kind of a formula that is going to tell me, based on all the data that I've measured, what is this acceleration? Or what is the mean of uh, the different values that I might have measured in a population of some observable? So for that, I have a formula that is going to use hopefully all the data that I have. And so if I a formula that uses all the values that I have is called, I'm not making this up, this is called a statistic. And if now this formula is used to evaluate specifically some quantity that characterizes the PDF, it then it is called by statisticians, it is called an estimator. And I'll give you examples of that. To be concrete, let's say that I have a PDF. This PDF could be uh, of some function of a parameter theta. Okay? Uh, the PDF could be any functions that you can think of uh, that would describe a physical system. And um, we're going to make a measurement conceptually of the system by repeatedly measuring uh, some observable x. And the value of theta is assumed here to determine how the function could look. So let, let me arbitrarily say, OK, I have some function of x. Let's say that if theta equals, I make this up as I go. Let's say that if for theta equal 1, the distribution looks like this. And for theta equals 2, it looks like this. And for theta equals 3, it looks like that. So the question then is, I measure data. So when I measure data, I might see something like this. and so on. So based on these data, now I'm interested in, in knowing the value of theta. So obviously theta one equal one and or two or three don't work here. So it might be something between one and two, I don't know. It would depend on the functional form of this function. But the idea is to use these data to extract the value of theta. So when I do that, obviously I have to account for the fact that I'm measuring data, this is a measurement, and as such I'm measuring, I, I get random numbers. So each of the value x that I, or that I measure here have a random uh, outcome, right? So it means that whatever value for theta that I get, it will also be a random number. And so I'm going to have some kind of a formula to determine this theta. And this theta is now going to be a random number, as we've discussed in the first lecture. And so consequently, what I will get is a specific number, which hopefully is related to the actual value of theta, but not necessarily the actual value of theta. So I will say that theta, and I will write it with a hat, I will say that this theta hat is an estimator of the actual value of theta. That's just the definition. Of course, <clears throat> when I carry out an experiment uh, and I do statistics to evaluate theta hat, uh, I will have different concerns. So uh, when I do this, <clears throat> am I getting values of theta that are in the neighborhood of the actual value, or am I far from the actual value? Am I systematically above or below the actual value? So I have notions of dispersion or uncertainties and notion of bias. Before I get to these, um, one more bit of uh, somewhat abstract thinking. Um, so I will give you example, concrete example in a moment. But when I calculate an estimator, I'm going to use the values of x that I have uh, obtained. And I'm going to calculate theta hat. Now, for this estimator theta hat to be, and the formula that I use to calculate it, for that formula to be useful, it better converge to the actual value of theta. And so uh, statisticians have the notion of what, is, uh, what they call a consistent estimator, 
which means that as you increase the data sample, the size of the data sample to infinity and going to infinity, the difference between the estimator and the actual value should become uh, progressively smaller and smaller in such a way that the probability of having a difference larger than some epsilon, epsilon being small, that probability will eventually vanish. So, so th this is more or less a mathematical trick to ensure that you have convergence of, of whatever formula you would, uh, would use to calculate um, uh, a, uh, a parameter theta. So estimators are really uh, statistics, uh, meaning that they are a function of all the variables that I've measured, all the values that I've measured. So they are a random variable as such. And because they're a random variable, they will have a PDF of their own. I'm going to call this PDF sampling distribution. What that means is that if the real value is theta, I have a certain probability density of me measuring theta hat. So I can adjust like this. I'm going to reuse. So I can write this way. So knowing that the, a the actual value of, of whatever parameter uh, I'm trying to extract is theta, I'm going to have a dis the distribution of theta hat. So um, ideally, I would like this to be a delta function. That would mean that every time I estimate the parameter, I get the right value. In practice, this is not feasible. So in practice, I'm going to get some kind of distribution. And this distribution will have certain um, width. And of course, the narrower this width is, the more precise the measurement will be. OK? So the point then is to try to characterize the measurement of theta uh, in terms of a PDF, or at least extract some characteristics of this PDF. The first thing I have to think about is what is the expectation value of this estimator? Okay, I, me I measure x, a, b a bunch of x values. From these, I calculate theta. If theta is systematically larger or smaller than the actual theta, I'm, I'm not in, in a good condition. So I want to know what. Uh, how well I'm doing here. So I'm going to define the expect, calculate, or, or at least conceptually, the expectation value of theta hat. This expectation value will be the mean of theta hat. So theta hat is what I've estimated. And g of theta hat given theta is the PDF of theta hat. Now g, as per what we've discussed this morning, G is a function of the probability of the data sample. And so I can replace G and the integration over theta hat by this function, the sampling PDF. And so I'm having, and if the measurements are all independent of one another, the, 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 the sampling PDF becomes the product of the PDF of each of the, the measurements. So this is f of x1, f of x2 times f of x, of x3, and so forth, all the way up to x, f of xn. And so by doing this integration, then I will get a value, the average value of this estimator. By the way, if, you, if you, something is unclear, feel free to ask questions. So the first thing we can then be concerned about is how different the expectation value will be from the actual value. So this difference is what we call the bias. You would like the bias to be zero. And so in a measurement, there will be two sources for biases. One will be instrumental, or the associated with the protocol of the measurement itself. And one will be, perhaps, in the statistics that you use to calculate the um, parameter theta. 
I'll give you examples of that in just a moment. So obviously, if B is equal to zero, if the bias is zero vanishing, we will say that the estimator is unbiased or that the experiment is unbiased. In the, present, on the, in the context of this presentation, I'm going to just talk about the statistics or the estimator as statistics. So we're, we're going to limit the discussion. <laughs> so if B equals zero, I have an unbiased statistics. I will show you an example in a moment where even well, in general, you can have some bias, some positive or negative bias, but if you go in the limit of an infinite number of measurements, then the bias, the bias vanishes, and so in that case, we say that we have something that is asymptotically unbiased. Okay, so if the measurement is here, if the real value is here and my distribution is centered on that measurement, I have zero bias. But if my measurement gives me an output like this, then obviously I have this much of a bias. Not good. The second thing I want to know is what is the width of this distribution? It's possible that I have zero bias, but my distribution looks like this. Or I'm lucky and it looks like this. Obviously, how wide the distribution will be depends on each of the PDF of each of the x1, x2, x3. And it will also depend on how many such values I have. So what is the width of this distribution? We will call that the mean square error, MSE. And that's going to be simply the second moment of the parameter theta that I'm looking at. In other words, it's the variance. Okay? So, but now I can do a little bit. Uh, um, okay, I, I <clears throat> overspoke here. And so the MSC is the, the expectation value of this difference. Let me insert in this difference minus the expectation value of theta hat plus the expectation value of theta hat. In, the, in other words, I will be inserting zero in here, not changing it. And so when I do this, I get this expression here. This is the expectation value of a square. So in principle, I can take the square of this expression. If you take the square, you could take the square of this part, the square of this part, and the square of the cross term. And so the first part, the square of the first part is what I have here, the square of theta hat minus the expectation value of theta hat. And the second part is here is what I have here. Okay? Now, this is what I defined on the previous slide, that's a bias. And this is obviously the variance of theta hat. It's the, the, the expectation value of, this, of theta hat minus the mean of theta hat squared. So that's the variance of theta hat. Now you say, okay, there's a cross term twice this, twice this term times this term. You can verify that this cross term is vanishing by definition. And so what I call the mean square error is the sum of the variance of the estimator and the square of the bias. And I can write this as the variance of theta hat plus b square. And so again, b square b will be how offset the, the PDF is from the true value. And the variance will tell me how fat this is, or this, how, how wide this is. OK. So obviously, when you carry out a measurement, you would like B to be zero, no bias, and you would like this term to be as small as possible so that your measurement is as precise as possible. OK. Now, so far, this, the discussion has been somewhat abstract. I really didn't tell you how I'm building an estimator. 
I'm interested in some quantity and I didn't tell you how I'm going to build an estimator. The fact of the matter is you can, whatever quantity you might be interested in, there's always a large number of ways of building an estimator. And I'm not going to be able to go in many details, no. but there are in principle many ways to build estimators or construct them. And some of them will be biased, some of them will be unbiased, and so on and so forth. Some will have a large variance, some will have a small variance. And it's just in, the t in terms of statistics, nothing being said about the actual measurement, the actual properties of the measurement. This is just in terms of statistics. Uh, so let me try to be specific here. Um, the simplest thing we can think of doing after a measurement of x1, x2, all the way to xn is just the mean, right? Um, the mean of a set of variables um, could be construed as an estimator, the, what I call the arithmetic mean, rather, or the sample mean. So I've measured n values of x. I can take the mean of these n values, I call that x bar, and I have some sense that this should be related to the mean of the parent PDF, the PDF of the X's, PDF of X. So I'm hoping that this is related to this, right? Now there's a distinction. This mu is a property of F of X. This X bar is a property of the sample. <laughs> Sorry, I go back and forth. And so mu tells you something about the PDF. So if you know the PDF, you can calculate mu. But when you carry out a measurement, you're really getting a value which depends on your measurement. And the hope is that x bar will map well on mu. So that's the first question I can ask you. How do you know that x bar is a good estimator of mu? So we can calculate two basic properties of this estimator to find out whether it in fact is a good estimator. So I can ask, is the mean, sample mean, a biased estimator? In other words, when I measure the mean of a sample, will I have, it, will I have a systematic bias? So how do I do this? I'm going to calculate mathematically, the, the expectation value of x bar. And so I'm calculating the expectation value of this simple formula. So I have 1 over n. That's a fixed number. I can take it out of the expectation value. I have now the expectation value of a sum. Well, an expectation value is a sum itself. It's an integral itself. And so I can commute it with the sum. And so now I have 1 over n, the sum, from i equal 1 to n of the expectation value of each of the value x sub i. Okay? So what is this? Well, it's very simple actually. The expectation of value of x sub i is the mean of x sub i evaluated with the entire distribution of x's. All right? And so the entire distribution of x's has a probability of f of x1 times f of x2 times f of x3 and so on, all the way to f of xn. But somewhere in the middle, I have f of xi, right? This xi corresponding to this one. Now, I get this expression because I have assumed that all of the measurements are independent of one another. If they were not, I would get something slightly more complicated, but the principle is the same. But in this case, this is really straightforward because all I have n integrals here. They will factorize. All of them but one will be trivial. So all of these integrals except one will equal one. And the only e integral which is not one is this one. And this one by construction is the mean of the PDF. So what I've shown you, and so now this mean I can introduce back in my sum, 
And so I have a sum of a fixed quantity, n times, so that's n times the mean, divided by n. That's just the mean. So what I've shown you, and this is something that you uh, have used, I'm sure, no doubt, you have taken the arithmetic mean of a bunch of numbers, thinking that this is going to tell you something correct about the mean of the actual population. You did it, and you were right. It's fine. There is no bias. Yep. Yeah, yeah, please, please. So this should I assume that if there is correlation between measurements, then the arithmetic mean is not an unbiased correlator? Um, no, in, in turn, no, actually, it, will, um, it turns out it will remain. Mm -hmm. But it's just that the evaluation is, is a little more complication, complicated. But it's just still unbiased. Is it's, it remains unbiased. So yeah. The question comes to mind. What is a typical bias estimator of the mean? Um, that's a good question. You could uh, sometimes when we do measurements, we have outliers. So you will see you will measure a bunch of numbers that are close to one another, and then you'll have numbers that are far off in one side or the other. If you include those. Uh, you will have a bias estimator because they are associated not with the distribution but some additional noise or some additional background. How do you know that? You don't. That's, that's <laughs> you, you never know, that's for sure. Yeah. So that's the problem. But it's a measurement problem, it's not a statistics problem. <clears throat> uh, another example that I can give you is an estimator of the variance. So I have a PDF, f of x. I want to know what the variance is. So I want to know sigma square. Like this. So I want to know this. So based on what I've done on the previous slide, based on what I've done in the previous slide, I can say, well, OK. Let me build something that looks like this. So here's what I have. Each value of x minus the, the arithmetic mean squared. I'm going to sum all those values. And I'm going to divide by n. OK? So this looks pretty complicated. But really, it's not that bad. Um, now, <clears throat> If x bar is really an estimator, not the actual value that I know, if I know the value, I can plug it in. If I know mu, I could plug it in. And then I could show that this estimator is unbiased. But when I actually do a measurement, when I carry out a measurement, I don't necessarily know the mean precisely, so I'm going to use an estimator of the mean. And so what I've done here is to explicitly put in that mean. And so now I have a, a sum of a square of, of a difference. So it looks complicated. Well, the first thing I can do is extract the 1 over n. Uh, and now I have a sum of expectation value. Clearly, I can swap the two. I can, uh, so I had, sorry. I had an expectation value of a sum. I've swapped the two. So now I have a sum of expectation values. But what I have in here is a square, so I have to do this carefully. Uh, so when I do the square, I will obviously have xi square, which is uh, what I will find here. I will have a cross term, xi times the sum of xj's, which is what I have here. And then I will have a square of this term. Uh, which is 1 over n square, uh, sum of, of xj and 1 over n sum of xk. And here I'm using different indices so that I can actually calculate the sums um, correctly. So this looks, again, a little complicated, but if you stare at this for a, little, for a little while, this sum can be swapped with the expectation value. This is what I have here. This here, uh, likewise, uh, it turns out <clears throat> can also be very simplified. 
And, and the most complicated part is really this here. Uh, this, uh, that's right. Uh, so here I have, there's a, there's a product missing. Well, it's, it's really a product here. And so, the, um, and, and, and here as well. And so this term here is xi times xj. I have x times time xj, and I, so I need to evaluate the expectation value of that. Here I have xj, xk. So I have xj, xk, uh, and I need to evaluate the expectation value of that. And so <coughs> in practice, if i and j are equal uh, or different, I will get two different outcomes. If i and j are the same, this becomes a square, the expectation value of a square. And so that will give me the second moment. If i and j are different, then I have the expectation value of a product of two quantities that are statistically independent, and consequently I can factorize the expectation values. So that will give me the first moment square. So here I have the second moment, here the uh, first moment square. And the same thing with this term. And then you, of course you have a bunch of n and square and cube and so on. After you do all the manipulation, you will get this simple expression. n minus one over n times sigma square. And so if n is finite, then the expectation value of the estimator is not this, the variance. It's going to be always systematically smaller than the variance. And so obviously if n now tends to infinity, if n is very large, n minus one over n when n is large, that will obviously um, tend toward one. And so this estimator is asymptotically unbiased. Now the next question of course you could ask is, okay, I have a biased estimator here. How can I make it bi unbiased? And I'm not going to go through the details. Uh, it's in the book, and it's also pretty straightforward, although tedious. You can, if, you can find that if you define the estimator as 1 over n minus 1 times the sum, that estimator is actually unbiased. So you may have wondered when we do statistics, we always use 1 over n minus 1. That's where it comes from. Uh, let's talk a little bit about histograms. And I know people know about histograms. <laughs> um, but in the context of, of what I'm talking about here, you can start thinking of histograms as statistics or estimators of, of a function. Right? So, let's say that you you are interested in the cross section of a quantity of a, a of a particle production like this, and let's say let's pretend that um, the the cross section might look like this arbitrarily. <clears throat> so, in principle, this. To, uh, from the theoretical side, uh, you have, you're going to calculate ma matrix elements and Feynman diagrams. And once you've done all that, you will have a functional, you know, functional form that will give you what this looks like, ideally. I'm not trying to minimize what theoreticians do, but you will get some function form. Experimentally, if you carry out your measurement with one collision, two collisions, a hundred collisions, a thousand collisions, you're going to be able to measure the momentum of the particle only so many times. So you're not going to be able to see this distribution. So what we do in practice is we build histograms. And you know what histograms are. If this is the PDF that I would like to measure, I'm going to partition the x-axis into so many bins and um, bins will have some finite, value, uh, finite width. It can be uniform, non-uniform, depends on, on the specificities of the measurement. But in general, I will partition the x-axis like this, and then I will go through all my data. Each data point that I look at, I will say, 
this data point? Is it in this interval, that interval, that interval, or which interval it's in? It, it, it's within, and every time I will add plus one to the content of the bin. So that's how you build a histogram. And I'm, I'm sure you've done this already uh, uh, many times. What I want to focus on here in the discussion is a histogram as a statistics. So obviously, um, I have some kind of a distribution and I may have millions of or gazillions of data in which case I can expect maybe that I can um, represent or obtain a representation of this uh, PDF very, very um, precisely, but sometimes I have very little amount of data and so I'm going to have to use very wide bins. And, and now I count how many um, particles, let's say, I have in this bin, that bin, that bin, and so on, and I will get something that is uh, potentially very, very crude, very approximate, uh, uh, a very poor approximation of the actual distribution. So the key point here is how many counts I get in each bin, given that I might have overall a sample of n um, <coughs> measurements. So this is what we call histograms. Um, and, you know, the histogram will be defined in some minimum to maximum range. I'm going to have uh, bins. If the bins are all the same width, uh, I w the, the width of the bin will be the maximum minus the minimum divided by the number of bins. And I, like I said, I scan all the data and I will look where each of the data value falls in and I increment each bin uh, by one uh, starting from zero. And so the bin content I'm going to ca call capital H sub I and that's going to be the number of hits so to speak, number of times I see X in a given bin. So what is that? What is that value? So I want to, ideally, I want to know the shape of this function. And so how do I get that? Well, the first thing I can do is, the, after I scan all the data, I have accumulated all the data, I have analyzed all the data, in each bin I have a bin content, capital H sub I. If I now divide that by the total number of measurements I have performed, I will have a frequency. H, uh, lowercase h sub i, will be essentially the, the frequency or the relative frequency of each bin. In the limit of the number of measurements going to infinity, I can see that h sub i should become representative of the function. And so in the limit of an infinite number of measurements, the value of h sub i, lowercase h, should be equal to the integral of the PDF of x within that bin. And so that's going to be the probability, p sub i, of x being in that bin. Obviously, if I sum all the bins, it should equal 1. Examples of this, I'm sure you've seen before. And so, <clears throat> in here, here, and here, I have 100 counts. Each histogram has been generated by Monte Carlo with 100 events. And this tells you that with 100 events, uh, you can't really tell the actual shape of the distribution. You can say that there's a peak. The peak is near zero, but you can't tell exactly. Um, in this, uh, in B here, I have a thousand um, events, thousand sam uh, sample of size thousand. In C, I have ten thousand, and here in D, I have a hundred thousand, or is it a million? A million. And so you can see that as I sample X many, many more times, um, the precision that I achieve in representing the, the the function becomes better and better. Now. Obviously here I see the actual shape. Um, the shape 
what that I get <clears throat> is not yet the actual this, uh, function. I have to think a little more about this. Um, just before I, before I actually talk about errors in a, in a histogram, uh, we can say a few things about uh, so-called weighted histograms. This is something that people uh, um, do. Um, uh, for instance, in your analysis, Victor, you have the, the, <coughs> the observable G2. G2 is essentially a quantity that delta P delta P times a function of P1 and P2 where delta P, and so delta P is P1, uh, P, P sub i minus the, the mean. And so <clears throat> I have the PDF here that I don't really know, that I'm trying to estimate, and I have delta P delta P, and I'm summing all of this. And so this then is a random number and so when I fill a histogram with delta P delta P, I am essentially having a weighted histogram. 